Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. And we are looking at the last part of it, a very important part. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, verse 11, until the end of that chapter. Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountains which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This is a stunning portion of the Word of God. Because it is, tells us the most important enterprise in the world. Sometimes people think that the business they are doing or the profession they are engaged in is the most important thing in the world. And, you know, it's important. And you must work hard. And you must be as efficient as possible. And uh, that's what the Bible says. You shouldn't be a lazy person. You should uh, deliver the due to those who employ you and so on. And uh, that is all true. Be that as it may, the Bible says that nothing can be exalted above our living God. Not your job, not your profession, not your silver and gold, nothing. And it's interesting that Jesus said that the greatest tension for human beings is between Worshipping God and worshipping mammon. There were many gods around. There were the Roman gods. There were the pagan gods, Molech and others. But Jesus didn't mention any one of them. That is telling. He knew human nature better than anybody else. And he said, you cannot love God and mammon. Mammon is an Aramaic term, the language that Jesus spoke for the goddess of wealth and riches. And so he's telling his disciples and all who hear that the biggest tension you have in the spiritual dimension is not whether to worship God or some other God, but it, be, it is between the worship of God and the lust for wealth. That is the tension. And while I'm on the subject, I might say that the reason why we teach stewardship at Calvary Church is not to raise funds. It is not because we have some idea that you've got to have so much money. The primary reason why we teach stewardship to God's people is to deliver them from the demon of mammon. Because when you learn to give according to the scriptures, you will be systematically exorcised from the lust for riches. 
And there is no liberation that is greater than that. Because many decisions that people make, even Christians, are made on the basis of what is more profitable. May I even venture to say that even so-called servants of God and preachers and pastors and leaders are bound by mammon. May start well, but you may not end so well. And here we see a story that gives us several characters. And the first character, set of characters that we come across here are the chief priests. The chief priests were the experts in theology. They knew all the prophecies in the Old Testament. They had read Isaiah 53, and they knew that the Messiah would suffer one day and be taken as a lamb to be sheared, and he would be silent, he would be dumb. Such specific details were given 750 years before Jesus was born. And yet for all, it is the chief priests, you can call them chief pastors these days. People who are teaching others the truth of the word of God. These were the people to whom God had given the responsibility of explaining his word to God's covenant people. And when you read this, you see what happened. I'll read it again. Now while they were going, that is, the ladies were going to tell the disciples about what they had seen, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. What were they reporting? They were reporting about the stunning resurrection experience that they had had. They came to tell the chief priests that Jesus had actually risen from the dead. What did the chief priests do? They called their henchmen, the elders, and they had a confab. Actually, it was a confab. And the consensus was that, and this is why consensus decisions are not always right. People somehow strangely think that if every, everybody agrees, then it must be right. They all agreed that Jesus should be crucified, and they were wrong. Now they all agreed that you should spin a yarn. And this is a common strategy of leaders. We can deal with it when it is unregenerate leaders, but you don't expect it of spiritual leaders. Some years ago, not too long ago, the National Geographic carried an article about why we lie, why we human beings lie. And in the research that they did, they found out that everybody on an average tells at least two lies a day. Now, I expected it to be more, but <laughs> <laughs> and I was mildly disappointed when I read the research. <laughs> Why didn't you say 20, you know? But that would have been a lie too. <laughs> People lie about various things. They lie because they want to project a different image of themselves. And we have graded these lives to soothe our consciences. We call some white lies, gray lies, whatever. 
and the real bad lies. All human beings lie. People who speak in tongues lie. People who don't speak in tongues lie. People who have words of knowledge lie. Pastors lie. Church leaders lie. And they lie in various ways. That's nothing new. 2,000 years ago they lied and the story hasn't changed because human nature is the same and education doesn't cleanse your morals. They lied saying, let's spread a story that Jesus didn't actually die, but his disciples came while you slept. Now look at this story, what a nonsensical story it is. It's telling those gods, you spread this story that while you were sleeping, the disciples came, opened the tomb and stole the body and hid it. <laughs> what fool would believe a story like that? Well, that's what you think. Amazing. Those gods, for neglect of duty, they could have suffered death. These gods agreed to the con. Why? Because they got money. Remember what I said about Matthew 6, 24, what Jesus said? These people risk their lives because of the love of money. The gods gladly took the large sum of money. No guarantee that they would even go home for dinner. It's possible that they could have been executed for neglect of duty. Those priests were smart. You tell that you were sleeping and they robbed the body. So you are incriminating them and they are agreeing to it all because they love the greenbacks. I want to tell you that much theological study does not deliver you nor save your soul. Okay? Doing deep studies alone will not save your soul. These chief priests were unregenerate, thieves who tricked and deceived the people. Look at the gods. A few verses before, we are told that the gods, they saw and heard the angel, they saw what happened in the tomb, and they were stunned by what happened. We, we read here, uh, and the gods, verse 4, the same jokers, and the gods shook for fear of him and became like dead men. These are the same gods who went and spread that story that Jesus never rose from the dead. You can have stunning experiences, spiritual experiences. And I say this because as Pentecostals, we are high on experience compared to other denominations. That's a plus point. We want God to intervene in our lives. And we believe that God intervenes today just as he did in years gone by. We believe in the presence of God. We believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's a plus point. But there is a big, big blind spot among many Charismatics and Pentecostals. Let me tell you what it is. Because I wouldn't want any of you to be misled in this way. Many times, and many Pentecostals think that as long as you have some experience with God, that's enough. 
you pray for a person and that person has some chills going through their spine or they feel warm in their head or they get healed they will automatically be saved nothing is further from the truth actually that is a lie and a deception of Satan to keep us from really sharing the gospel with people. Now I was thinking yesterday, I'm now on my 55th year of ministry. And legion <laughs> are the number of people whom I have encountered who have had experiences with God, who have had answers to prayer, who have felt a touch in their body as they have been prayed for, who have come with many felt needs and God has answered them and uh, touched them and shown them who He is. That is an outward experience in your body or sometimes in your emotions. Those are outward experiences and God does it. Why? Because God is merciful. Because God wants you to get some evidence, especially if you are an unbeliever and you don't value the word of God. God wants you to have some encounter that as an intelligent person you will pursue to find out what is going on here. But most people don't pursue just like the gods who had such a cataclysmic experience, if I were to say. And a few moments later, they denied it as if it had never really happened. You can have answers to prayer. You can have wonderful worship services and experience them. You can experience healing. You can experience even deliverance from demonic powers. Jesus talked about it and he said when the demon is cast out and the house is empty, the demon goes around and gets seven more and comes and uh, inhabits that person. You can have as many reasons of encounters and types of encounters as the number of people here, that does not mean you are saved. Please remember that when you are talking to people. When God does something, yes, you can praise Him and shout and say hallelujah, but that is not salvation. Let me tell you what you need to have. And I want this to be etched in your mind like nothing else. I will keep referring to it until I'm satisfied that you have got it. This is what Jesus said to Paul, to open their eyes unless your spiritual eyes are open in order to turn them from darkness to light. Unless you turn from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, not to the power of God, but to have a relationship with God, he, Luke omits the power word, power he could have said, to turn from the power of God, to the, from the power of Satan to the power of God, but he didn't say that, he deleted it. Because Christianity has to do with a relationship with God, not just experiencing the power of God. Many people experience the power of God. The gods experience the power of God, but they never experience God. This is why in charismatic and Pentecostal churches, you have so many people who can tell a, give a testimony about this or that. And that's good. But don't get fooled. That's not salvation. Salvation is when you turn from the power of Satan to God and you receive what? Forgiveness of sins. 
Now, that's a very difficult thing. The reason I'm telling you this is, don't think that people are going to accept this easily. When you tell people that they are sinners and they need forgiveness, many will say, no, I'm not such a bad sinner as my neighbor. I'm a better sinner than him. People hate to hear that they are sinners. But what does the Word of God say? All have sinned. It says, there is no one righteous, no, not one. God is saying that not one person is righteous. Everybody is unrighteous to begin with until you have an encounter with the Lord and repent and the trauma of repentance. I call it the trauma of repentance because it is traumatic and that is why it is deleted from a lot of preaching today. That is why even evangelists don't talk about repentance. They talk about all the blessings you can get when you follow Christ. If you don't repent, there is no salvation, no matter what blessings you may get. Doesn't matter. And all these blessings last for a short while. I saw that Warren Buffett was quoted by, by a TV interviewer, uh, and that title was, uh, Warren Buffett says, I will give one year of my life to eat what I like. The guy has billions of dollars, and I don't know what his real story is, but that was the title, but I don't know if those were his exact words. As you know, marketing people do a little twist here and there just to, you know, have a hit. <laughs> And, uh, but that's interesting. You think that when you work so hard and accumulated billions, at the end of life you can enjoy it? No, we are fooled a lot. What we learn from the guardsmen is that no matter what experience you have, Unless you really encounter the Lord Jesus Christ, you are lost. None of these things will save. And so they took the money and they went and spread the story. And the other stupid thing is that Matthew writing about 30 to 40 years after this yarn was put out by these people, says, uh, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. In other words, the story that the gods spread, even 30 to 40 years later, they were still spreading it. No social media, no Facebook, none of that, no TikTok. But yet, word of mouth, it spread. You know why? And that's another revelation of human nature. You can be confronted with the truth, but you love to believe a lie. Now, roll back your own life story. And what do people like to hear? Juicy stories. And what do they like to spread? Juicy stories. So, people spread lies faster than they spread the truth. And we tend to believe lies without really investigating stuff also. This is crazy. They believed a false story. So what's the difference between these Three groups of people, the chief priests, the elders, the guards, four groups, and the others who chose to believe a lie, and the disciples. Because we are told 
that Jesus met them. Now, these 11 disciples, in my opinion, which doesn't really matter, post, you know, all the other things they have done, after being with the Lord for three and a half years, they saw him raise the dead. They heard the marvelous words of Jesus. They witnessed how he healed the sick and how he fed the 5,000. They knew all these things. And yet for all, Matthew 26, verse 56 says, and they all forsook him. But Jesus still had mercy on them. You know why? There's a difference between all those other guys and the disciples. The disciples had failures due to stress. The others were cunning people who, in the face of truth, denied it. Diabolical. God knows the difference. We may not sometimes. The chief priests knew the prophecies. The guards had an experience that was undeniable. The common people chose to believe a lie. And the elders conspired together with the chief priests. We are living in a world of lies. And the devil is called the father of lies. Jesus called his disciples, called the people who were listening to him one day, you are of your father, the devil. He's the father of lies. In the midst of this depressing situation, when even the disciples were afraid and in hiding because what they did to people who were false messiahs, or they caught the, the followers of these false messiahs and gave them the works. And naturally, these disciples would have been afraid that they would be rounded up. And so, Jesus knew how to deal with them. Jesus told them to go to Galilee, familiar ground. They were all Galileans except for Judas, who was a southerner. And Jesus said to them, look at how Jesus deals with those who are truly his disciples. He invests in them. He believes in them. And he restores them. And he told those women, to tell the disciples, go to Galilee. I will meet you there. That's the mercy of God. Because he had the greatest commission in the world in his mind to commit to them. These were the people who denied him. These were the people who ran away from him. These were the people who had had so many experiences, but in a time of testing and difficulty, they failed miserably. But Jesus knew that they were true, they are genuine, and they are sincere, but they are weak and they fell. You know, disciples today are not perfect people. The world expects us to be perfect. The world expects us to, and that is a convenient cop-out for the world. Because many times you would have heard people say, disappointed with Christians, disappointed with those who claim to be this and claim to be that, and look at the way they behave, and they are now believing another lie, that as long as you can find enough number of fakes and hypocrites to satisfy your quantum, that God will excuse you from the responsibility that he has placed on you. That's a lie of the devil. Because on that judgment day, you can't stand before God and say, 
Lord, I was in this church or that church, and, you know, I, I uh, got to know some people, and they are not genuine, they are not this and that. They played me out or whatever. So I'm not going to take a back seat, and I'm not going to serve. And you think God's going to say, right, you're right, man. And uh, he's going to tell his angels, this guy has a justifiable excuse. So he'll be okay on the judgment day. Is that what God is going to say? He's going to be displeased with you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Jesus had a reason why he had faith in the disciples and invested in them. And Jesus has a reason why you are his disciple and why he has faith in you. The reason has not changed because he's counting on you. In the midst of a world of lies with billions of people who are lying through their teeth every moment of the day and who are propagating lies, Jesus wants you and me to be a person of truth, a messenger of truth. I'm guilty myself of lying, exaggerating as I look back on my life. We are all. We can't exonerate ourselves. But the most important thing is to realize that when Jesus touched my life and I became his, he expects me to be a messenger of truth and there is no excuse that he will accept. And this is nothing new. In a world of darkness, in a crooked and perverse world, we are told, as Paul wrote to the Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, you are to shine as lights in the world. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 10, God told the prophet that you are a watchman, and if you don't warn the wicked of the error of his way, these are chilling words, if you don't warn the wicked of the error of his way, his blood will I require at your hand. So we have an obligation to share the truth we know, the little truth we know. Say, but I don't know much. I'll tell you something. If you, your friends, your relatives, your associates, your colleagues who don't know the Lord, they don't know as much as you know. You know that? Because you have encountered and experienced the grace of God in your life. At least you can share your testimony. There are many things everybody can do. But we lose those opportunities because we don't realize that God has called us and placed us to be instruments of truth in a dark and perverse world. No excuse whatsoever. He's calling all of us to teach others. And these words of Jesus that we find from verses 18 to 20 are probably the most important words in the New Testament. Because it explains what is called the Great Commission. We are not here just to get our anxieties driven away and to get our sicknesses healed. If you get healed, and I'm not deprecating this because I have experienced a divine healing. And what we mean by divine healing is healing without recourse to medicine. Okay? So that is not the issue. The point is that God's power within and inside your life healing you from the greatest malady of all, which is the rotten nature of sin. Because the Bible says that man is desperately wicked. All human beings. And who can know it? So we have a responsibility as God's people
to share the gospel wherever we are. And I have to tell you this, God is speaking to some of you, not only to be good witnesses where you are, but one day to burn your bridges behind you. And as I'm speaking now, the Holy Spirit is speaking to at least one person here. I don't know who you are, but I know. And you might be saying to yourself, I don't know, God is calling me. Yeah, that's fine. Nurture that call. Don't kill it. If you have a sense that God is calling you to be a full-time messenger of His, which means giving up your job and making a decision from now on, I will go where the Lord wants me to go, do what He wants me to do, I'm His servant, that's the biggest uh, possession I have and that's what my call is. Some of you will get that call. Say, so what about my wherewithal? How am I to live? Trust God. He will not let you down. And you will know that sometimes even before you come to know the Lord. When I was a small fellow about this high, I remember calling my sisters and brother, they were the captive audience, and I put on my mother's, what do you call, kimono or nighty, and I pretended that I was a clergyman, and I was, you know. And as I grew up and all that, I had certain goals, certain professional goals, and I worked so hard for them, and I got through those exams, and I got the plum job that I was wanting. Three times I was offered that job. That's the time the Lord said, that's it. So did you hear a voice? No, I didn't. I can't say I've heard an audible voice. Have you seen a vision or a dream? I can't say. But I knew through his word, speaking to me, that now's the time to say goodbye to all your dreams. You know, sometimes people say, God will fulfill your dreams. Your dreams may not be from God. You can't use God to fulfill your dreams. You fulfill God's dream for you. I took that step, and I don't want to go into too much details about our family and all that, but I can tell you that God is faithful. Many people work hard for success, and uh, after they find that success doesn't really satisfy, they look for significance. And the marks of that search for significance is when people do charity all of a sudden when they're about 80 years old. Because now you need something to make you feel good, and that's what Maslow calls self-actualization. Jesus didn't talk about self-actualization. He talked about self-transcendence. But let me tell you something, that there is nothing more significant in this world, and you can have that significance every day of your life, whether you are doing a little job with very small income, or whether you are a billionaire, whatever it is, you can have that significance many times in a day and many times over your life. You know what? If you share the gospel with people. But we, especially, again, as charismatics, we are obsessed with our anxieties and problems and difficulties, and that clouds our mind, and we do not see the needs of others for salvation and deliverance. God is calling you to quit your job and answer the call and be a full-time worker. Don't kill it. Don't try to do something that smothers it. Nurture it. 
come and talk to us. We'll pray with you and show you how to and guide you if we can about what to do and how to go forward. Just find out what God wants you to do. I'm not saying that everybody should quit their job. God is a time. He may call you today, but the time you step out may be 10 years from now. The Lord is calling you. Say, yes, Lord. I am ready. Help me. Help my unbelief. I don't have faith, but you help me. God will. God will. Jesus never fails. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you right now. You're such a good God. Lord, we just can't understand how you showed so much mercy to us. We thank you, Lord, for your word that shows us who we are in a real sense. Give us grace to be true and faithful to you, Lord, and to serve you to the very end. And for those who have got a call from you and who are not sure, I pray especially as a church, we pray, Lord, that you will continue to speak and confirm in their hearts that your hand is upon them and give them that feeble faith to believe and to go in the way that you are telling them to. Oh God, you're a merciful God. And for all the people who come to our mind because they do not know you, who are in our circle of influence, I pray that you will continue to talk to us and pray through us. Help us, Lord, to pray through on these people so that they will come through and their names will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In Jesus' wonderful name I pray. Amen.